Exactly. One. <laughs> All right, welcome to the live stream. You know, three seconds before, I was like, we have three minutes, and that's certainly not the case. Um, <laughs> yeah, just put in a piece of candy. <laughs> so Don't we're going to answer Sorry, uh, your home buying questions here. Um, and clearly, I'm not entirely ready because I have everything set up on the wrong side. There we go. Um, cool. So what we're going to do is answer home buying questions. Leave those in the chat. Here with me is Dan Frio. Uh, we work on the same team. So we're loan officers licensed in all 50 states. Um, we don't have some big, huge call center. Uh, it's just us and a small team of loan officers who would be happy to help you at winthouseyoulove.com. Um, but what we're going to do today, we're going to go through questions. We're going to tee it over to Dan to go talk about what's going on with economics and interest rates because those have d uh, jumped down just a touch here. We'll go through your um, questions, and then we'll jump into uh, how much can you afford and understanding how lenders determine that along with what you should do. So we'd love to know before we get started, where's everybody from? Um, so leave down in the chat, maybe city, state, if you don't want to talk about your city, um, no problem. We have Anthony in here, uh, Kenya, we have Annalisha, uh, Giselle, De Decolis, Decolis? Uh AJ Mama, welcome. Um, Dan, do you want to cover what's been going on with interest rates uh, and economic data uh, recently? You see the bags under my eyes, folks? <laughs> it's from Restless Nights. So what you've seen, if you just capitalize the market over the last two days, this is basically showing you what's kind of behind the scenes. Um, one day when the Federal Reserve comes out and says, oh, we're probably not going to, we're not going to reduce rates here or anytime soon. That was yesterday. Just hints of it that we're kind of, you know, we're going to stay higher for longer. Would the, would the stock market do yesterday? Down six, seven hundred. Um, but miraculously, mortgage rates actually dipped a little bit. And I called that we'd be in the, the high sixes by today. And we are in the high sixes today. So basically what came out today was the ADP uh, jobs report. It was dismal. That was basically the only report that came out. But Federal Chairman Powell, he sat in front of Congress today and spoke. And there must have been good news. I wasn't able to uh, listen to it or watch it. I usually do. Um, but it must have been good news because the stock market, I think, is up 100 or 200 points again. And you're seeing the MBS market. If you watch my channel, we watch what's going on with mortgage-backed securities. Uh, right now that those securities are up, let me pull up my screen. You guys can't see it here, but I'll pull it up on my screen to let you guys know where the MBS market is up. It is up right now now 20 ticks. So that means mortgage rates are going to ease just a little bit more. We should be maybe at 6.95 by tomorrow. But guys, it's a crapshoot. We don't know basically one day or another. So it's hard to it's hard to time the market right now when to buy, where to buy. It's also really hard to time the market when you're locking in the rates. That's why we pride ourselves that we're one of the country's largest brokers. Uh, we, we do work at a federal bank. We're also one of the country's largest brokerages. And we pride ourselves on that because what will happen is yesterday we locked in a bunch of people because I didn't know what this employment number was going to look look like today. So if you're out there, you might be one of our borrowers that I spoke with last night saying, I need to, I need to lock you guys tonight. Um, and then based on the data that comes in for today, you know, I thought if the jobs number was really, really good, mortgage rates would spike or go way up. Okay. It didn't happen. Actually, the, the report came in better than expected. So now everybody, we locked yesterday. We're going to relock you again with another investor today so we can capitalize these lower rates. So that's basically what's going on. So it is a day to day, basically daunting when it comes to the market. And there's, I've never seen this in, you know, over the last two, three years, it's been like this, but in my 30 year career, mortgage rates usually just are steady. It's very odd that mortgage rates go up like a quarter percent in a day. Uh, and we've seen that. And then it's not the, the, you know, eventually the markets will stabilize. But right now it's just, it's a day-to-day -day thing. So um, if you're checking on, you know, trying to get pre-qualified or chase, trying to chase that lowest rate, be careful. Uh, you, I would highly suggest you using a company like us that we were set up with over 73 different lenders. We're going to do your rate shopping for you guys. So that's... That, that's the kind of what's going on in the economy. So now on to questions, buddy. What do you think uh, in terms of rate locks? Um, where should people be if they're under contract right now for a home? Are you thinking locking rates, waiting for some more information? Yep. If you're in, if you're 30 days or less lock and uh, you're just going to go have to go with it, unfortunately. Um, if you're over 30 days late and you're locked in, we actually have a service where we're going to review your rate and your fees uh, for you. And we haven't really promoted that this 
you know, that much recently. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of weird because Kyle and I, we talk about this a lot on our channels. You know, we do have a, a, you know, where you can upload your loan estimate so we can review it to see, can we get you a lower rate? Can we get you lower fees? Here's the weird thing is probably 90, 90 to 95% of them, we can clobber the terms that you're getting right now, but uh, people don't return the phone calls or don't reply. And they're like, I'm like, don't you want to save $20,000? So it's just weird. And, and I did have a call today and, and Kyle, we, we had one of these calls, I think like two weeks ago, I had a, a buyer call me today and he's like, man, my realtor is really pushing me not to use you guys. They want me to use the, our local lender. And why do they want you to use their local lender, Kyle? There's two answers here and you're probably going to nail one of them for sure. Oh, so you, you take it. Sorry. I've been, uh, I was managing some stuff. Oh, back in. Most likely the realtor <laughs> and the loan officer have something in common. If you guys know what I mean by this, um, just because we're out of state doesn't mean we're bad. Doesn't mean we don't know what we're doing. Call us. If you're a realtor out there and you have a house under contract and you want to learn more about us, we're just two YouTube guys. Call me. You can Google us. You can do anything you want. Do your due diligence. We are a valid bank. We are a valid brokerage. And we I've been doing this for as long as Kyle's been alive. So we're not just a farce out there. We do do business. And most of the time when your realtor's really pushing for you to use a specific lender, there's probably a little bit of a monetary value uh, there for them. And I get it. Some of them aren't getting a kickback, but they're comfortable with that mortgage advisor. But guys, you also have to realize there are other lenders out there that might be able to really get you a much better uh, terms on your mortgage. And that's what we're here for. But our whole goal is education, education, education. And that's why we present these videos every week. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can just upload your quote here uh, for us to review it. Um, and then what we'll do is it will come to Dan and then he'll record a video um, with what rates we can offer versus what your current lender is offering. And you can compare that here. So you can upload that securely uh, just when the house you love .com, go to tools and then compare your quotes. Um, let's jump into some questions here. Um, Anthony Hernandez, you asked, does child care and rent count towards your debt to income ratio? Um, rent will not count towards your de debt to income ratio because uh, you're not going to be paying rent when you end up getting the mortgage. And then child care uh, does not. So child support, if you pay that or receive it as income, that will count in your debt to income ratio. But child care, if it's just like um, you pay like daycare, basically, uh, would not count in your debt to income ratio, except um, on VA loans, they do look at child care costs in residual income calculations. Most people aren't going to run into that, um, but it is something to be aware of if you're looking at a VA loan. Uh, Kenya Burns, ten thousand per month salary, stable employment, uh, with eighteen hundred dollar uh, debt, student loan, and car note, um, seven twenty credit score. Oh, okay, this is for when we're covering the. Um, uh, how much, how can, much can I have afford? afford calculator. Yep. <laughs> okay, let me. You know what, let's let's hold on the calculations for now. Is that okay? Just answer yep. maybe ten questions or so, and then we'll go out to ask you guys, you know, for your specifics, so we can run an affordability calculator out there for you guys. Hey, I, I got a question, Kyle. You might know this. Remember when we did the video with uh, Just Breet? Well, I, I go in a lot of his t uh, YouTube videos and live events, and he always asks people to give him guac. And they put in a little caption down there that's like a, an avocado or something like that. Okay. If you guys know how to do that, try it out for me if you don't mind. It's kind of cool. When you're on his videos, he'll say, okay, let's get some guac, folks. And the screen lights up with, with uh, little a, avocados um, things on the side. So it's, okay, it, might it be amuses a, me. It might be a custom emoji that you can do if you're a oh, channel member. Uh, that okay. may be what he's doing. Um I mean, give us a thumbs up, folks. Or I'm, I mean, I'm sure you could just put in like a guac emoji. Like, here is this. Is this what you're looking for? These. Uh, see it. Well, That's is this, it. Is this it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand goes. why. Why would we want? Kenya, that? <laughs> thanks. Kenya found it. Thanks, Kenya. If you could share how you did that, maybe I don't know. Hey, there we go. AJ Momo. It's M it's just an emoji. Um, okay. Let's see Sorry, what folks. else we got. Milwaukee. I, I just check out. Lovely to see you. You post a lot on my YouTube channel, uh, the uh, comments. Thank you for joining us. I don't know who you are. I think I'm, you know, you, you make some comments that I kind of might know you about a lunchroom or something. So maybe email me and let me know who you are if you don't mind. But uh, without further ado, let's get to it. Sorry, guys. 
Giselle, I'll get, well, I'll put a star next to your question. We'll jump back to that when we do affordability. Um, AJ, mama, I've been pre-approved for 260,000, but in reality, I want to spend 225 or less. I'm feeling discouraged because I need a good area in school zone for my three kids. Do I settle or wait? I'm looking in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, my first thought with that is, so where are the, what are the price ranges of the homes that you are wanting to, um, uh, get into in that good area with that school zone? Um, also I'm, I'm curious if you only have one school zone that you're looking at, or if you have multiple, is there a way that you can extend, uh, your commute just a little bit? Maybe it's not the, the best, you know, the most ideal school zone, but maybe it's the second best or the third best, um, that you want to get your kids into. And if maybe those areas are a little bit cheaper. Um, so I'm curious how much difference is your, 225 purchase price range versus uh, the areas that you're wanting to look in. Um, do you have anything to add there? You know, the only thing, yeah, the only thing I would say is, and I don't know if you have this prompted and ready, but the Altos. Altos mm -hmm. is a system. We actually had Mike, the owner, on it uh, with to do us uh, did a live with us last month. We use that system behind the scenes because everybody, I, I put a comment on my YouTube channel. It's like, what do you guys really want to know about? Most people want to know, you know, is my market going to crash? That's probably the number one. Should I wait? What should I do? So we actually asked Mike on, uh, it's Altos Research. You can actually go in there and get a free report on the area, the exact area you're looking to buy, because I don't know where you're looking to buy. You know, I don't know the details of the area and so forth. So this is actually what the report's going to look like. Um, if you go into Altos Research, and Kyle can kind of show you how to do that, but he'll show you how to read this report. These are just the tools that we provide you guys because I want you to do your research yourself. I don't want you guys to rely on us or any other YouTube channel to tell you you should buy, you should rent, what should you do? You guys figure that out, and we're here to give you the tools. Yeah, the thing that you could take a look at in Tallahassee is um – Instead of just going t with Tallahassee, you could start putting in individual zip codes of different neighborhoods that you're looking at. So uh, let's see, AJ Mama. The What I would do is maybe start taking a list of what uh, zip codes align with the school systems that you're looking to get into. Um, and then from there is looking through these zip codes. Uh, you can start taking a look at where might there be a little bit more ease um, in some of these markets that you could negotiate for maybe some lower purchase prices. Um, so whenever this number goes down, it goes into a buyer's market territory. Buyer's markets where you're going to have a better chance of um, putting in an offer that's lower than list price uh, and getting that accepted. On a seller's market, sellers have control and it's usually going to be more, uh, more tough, higher prices, higher competition. And so just in Tallahassee as a whole, um, the trend has been more towards a seller's market in the past few months since the beginning of this year. So even though it's just at a slight seller's advantage, it's probably unlikely that it's going to be easier to buy in Tallahassee sooner or later. That's where I'd start going into those zip codes and maybe narrowing down if there's some opportunities there. Um, Thanks, man. Sure thing. Uh, Alicia, 1985, do you have to have a good score to get a USDA loan? Um, in reality, yes. Uh, the bare minimum USDA can go down to a 500 score, but not every lender does it, and it's really difficult to get those loans to work. Um, so really having a 640 and above is going to get you uh, an automated approval through USDA, basically where it goes through an underwriting software that approves it. Um, having higher than a 680 is going to give you better chances of getting that approval. Um, really, if I was looking at a USDA loan, I'd want to have the highest credit score, uh, you know, as high as you can possibly get it um, to have the highest chance of approval because USDA can be really finicky uh, to work with sometimes. Um, thank you for all the info you guys provide. I just paid off all my debts. Um, how much home can I realistically afford? Oh, okay. That's another affordability. I'll put a star in it and we'll get back to it. Um, we promise folks. <laughs> living in Omaha. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being here, David. Appreciate it. Uh, how thanks, is David. the Omaha market? I'm curious. Um, let's see. We have Alabama, Cleveland, Bunker Hill boys again. Hey guys, what's, uh, what's Virginia? Bunker here? Hill boys. Um, yeah, Robin is here again. Welcome, Robin. Uh, hey, Kyle and Dan, hey, I'm just on to gather information from you guys uh, for me to buy my new home. Um, welcome. Uh, Billy said, Brentwood, California. Thank you guys for the show. Sure to appreciate you guys. Thanks, Billy, for being here. Um, I've been watching all your videos. What's my rate with a 735 credit score? You want to take that? 
Yeah, there's so Maximus, I'd love to answer your question, uh, but there's more to the equation that I need. I can't do it right now if you could email me. But here's what we need when you're when you're looking for a, a specific quote. I need to know the zip code you're looking to buy, um, the property, the purchase price, how much money you're looking to put down. And what kind of property is it? Is it a single family home, a two unit, a condo, a townhouse, whatever? Just let me know those those things. Um, I'll get right back with you and saying, okay, here's what, if you were to qualify, here's exactly the rate that you could qualify uh, with. So th there is a lot of, there's multiple pieces of the equation that I need for that. So just email me and my email address is right there. Kyle, just put it up. And as soon as the video is over, I'll run pricing for you and get right back to you. All right, uh, Bunker Hill boys. So you were you had a question last week on a VA appraisal, and if I remember right, you're the seller, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they declared Tidewater this past Thursday. We submitted several comps. We're still waiting. No value as of today. Um, do they not have a certain timeline? So for those of you who aren't aware, on a when someone's buying with a VA loan, you have to have an appraisal. Um, if the appraisal comes in short, normally with other loans like conventional and FHA, the appraiser just hands in the appraisal at the value, um, and that's what it is. On VA, there's this thing called Tidewater, where basically the appraisal, <laughs> at least this is how I view it, the you get a notification from the appraiser. He's basically like, hey, uh, this is gonna come in short. And I'm going to give you two days, 48 hours to give me comps that are better than what I have. Um, and if you can show me comps that are better, then I will change the price. Otherwise, it's going to come in short. They kind of give you a warning. Um, and so, again, they give you they give the seller 48 hours or the listing agent um, 48 hours to be able to produce uh, better comps than what the appraiser is using. Um, I'm sorry. They, they asked the buyer, not, that, not the seller. Um, so... If you haven't heard back yet, they said this past Thursday, um, that Tidewater period's already over. Uh, so somebody's not sharing that information with you <laughs> is what, what I'm anticipating. Um, because it's 48 hours for uh, new comps to be submitted to the appraiser. Um, after that, it should come back within less than a day. Um, unless there's some other error or quality issue on the appraisal, even then, for it being last Thursday and not coming back yet, somebody's not communicating um, is what I would believe. Um, all right. Columbus, Ohio. Are you guys seeing, uh, currently seeing two or three K FHA loans successfully get accepted? Do you want to take that? I honestly, I, I don't even know if I have any myself, two or three K pre-approvals out there. Um, a lot of people are, are, we, we had a couple people ask for them, but it's not a huge appetite right now for some reason. Uh, and I think the reason is, is a lot of investors, they're trying to dig deep and, um, you know, that where they start is houses that do need some repairs. So we, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, we don't, we don't get a lot of two or three K applications, uh, for some reason or another. We probably get probably about eight applications a day. So it's not like we just get one or two. We get a substantial amount of applications, just not a lot of two or three K loans right mm -hmm. now. And I'm, I'm not sure why the only, like I said, the only reason why I can think of it is investors are, you know, pulling up those and grabbing those before they even hit the market for a lot of the ones that are worth, you know, have value. Uh, living in Omaha, you said, why do you think so many people believe the market is going to crash? So without us going into like super all the data and stuff, cause we talk, it, it's just not even like fun to talk about that. <laughs> um, I think there's room for valid criticism about, uh, the market and analyzing the market. Um, but yeah, like Dan is doing what I think why a lot of people are on this is just because currently it's what gets a lot of views on YouTube and that translates to ad revenue. Um, cause if you notice kind of a theme with a lot of commentary around there being a crash is usually what happens is there's some small tick in data. Someone makes an, a video and it's like, a fire or a tsunami or some natural disaster happening. Um, and Jerome Powell somehow is there for some reason. Uh, it, it's a lot of like fear and that's what's selling um, and working. And so I don't, I haven't found there to be a lot of valid critique or a lot of valid market analysis. It's a lot of people who are uh, real estate agents who may or may not have sold a lot of business or, or are very experienced. Uh, and I've just, <laughs> don't give me shifty eyes, Dan, uh, and then start making commentary about the market. I don't make commentary about the market. I'm not a market expert. Um, what I'm good at is, is understanding loan guidelines and communicating those. And so, uh, I don't feel like it's valuable for me to talk about 
you know, market analysis. Um, and I don't think it's valuable for a lot of real estate agents to talk about market analysis uh, because most of them either don't have an economics degree, don't have the economics background, or just aren't really sure what they're looking at other than reiterating what headlines are already saying. So I think that's kind of, that's why I think that's a little bit prevalent. Yeah. And I always get a kick out of, you know, they crash, crash, crash. And then they tell you, you know, I'm a realtor, a CPA, a financial advisor, a mortgage broker, a mortgage advisor. And I also sell real estate classes, but they tell you every day for the last three years, go back here. I'll just give you one, one task to do. That's all. Go back to a lot of those people that put have been putting those crash videos out. Go back a year or two, see how many views they were getting. Okay. And then when they flipped over to the crash videos, what did their views do at that point? And you'll see that they exponentially quadrupled in most cases. So they just stick with the bandwagon of the crash. But when you when you ask them, you know, they always pivot back to 2008, 2010. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, there was a reason for that. You should understand this if you're selling real estate and you understand the markets. But other than that, why do you see a crash? And nobody has the answer. So if you're on the crash bandwagon, God bless you. Keep sitting on the sidelines and waiting. There's no, no, no pressure for you to buy at all. Um, do, do, do. Let's get to a couple of questions and then we'll jump into affordability stuff. Uh, let's do a little speed round here. Uh, Deborah, you said, I already have a hard pull against my credit, which will drop uh, on March 28th. Um, should I wait until that drop off to allow you to do a hard pull? Um, March 28th of last year, that is going to have almost zero impact on your credit right now. Um, so credit pull, wait, there you go. I'll run out the clock for a second. So a uh, credit pull. That's um, okay. Go ahead. With it. <laughs> only affects your score zero to five points. Um, and then after that first pull, you have 45 days for unlimited mortgage inquiries. They're still going to show up on your credit report, but they're not going to count against your score. So a credit pull is nothing to be worried about. You need a hard credit pull to get an accurate pre-qualification. Um, if your credit is not being pulled, you do not have a mortgage approval that you can trust. And the reason that I know that's true is is because no loan can close on a soft credit pull. All loans that close and get funded have to close with a hard credit pull. It's the most accurate way to get information. It's the only way to run your information um, and get it closed uh, and actually have a loan at the end of it. So hard credit pulls are nothing to be afraid of. Good job, Kyle. Everybody give them some guac. Still got time. Still got time. Um, we need guac, folks. We need the guac. <laughs> Jay, uh, I've been... Approved with contingencies, um, 760000 with 10% down. Is it too late to back out of this deal, or can I still shop around for a 5% conventional loan down payment? Take it away. You, uh, J-Bo, it depends on when you're closing um, and your contract and a bunch of things. What I always tell people is you're not really obligated in the mortgage until you close on the loan. On, on your home. Okay. So you should be able to, if, if you have at least th uh, three weeks left before you close, I would love to analyze your, what you're, what you're getting. And what I mean by that is what kind of rate you're getting, what kind of terms you're getting, what kind of fees you're getting and everything else. But there shouldn't be any reason why with your current lender, you, you go back to them and say, okay, I was putting down 10%. What would it look like if I, I put down 5% now? The seller, all they're concerned about is they just want their money on time that you don't delay the closing. OK, but if you start getting a lot of pullback or pushback from your lender, please reach out to us. If you have at least three weeks left, I'd love to help you in any way, any, any way we can. Uh, you know what I just realized? I should probably add that to our form for the loan comparisons is how much. No, we, we asked the day of the closing. Never mind. For, <laughs> that's already included. Um, OK, sweet. Let's go into some affordability stuff really quickly. Um, so doo -doo -doo, let me pull this up, find the little magic screen share button. Um, cool. So what we do is we have this calculator called the max purchase price, um, and it's in the description um, down below. So if you want to, you can use the code live, L-I-V-E, for 20% off. Um, but what it does is it helps you understand the math that loan officers use to determine uh, how much loan you could get um, without having to, you don't have to talk to anybody. You, you could you get to explore the numbers on your own um, in a way where you you get to see everything. Um, so what we first do is enter your info, like what the down payment's going to be. So the minimum on a conventional loan is three percent. Let me zoom in a touch more here, so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, 
I'm gonna put in 6.8% for the average rates for today. We're gonna to do a 30 year loan. And then the rest of this, we're just gonna leave as these average estimates so we don't have to, to touch them right now. So let's do uh, Kenya Burns. Uh, you said $10,000 per month salary. First, I'd love to know what, what job are, do you have that's $10,000 a month salary? Um, that's, a, that's a pretty sweet gig. Uh, usually once you get up into that range, like commission, overtime, uh, things like that. Um, so what I'll do is I'll put in the yearly gross income that, cause that's what lenders use, uh, to determine how much you can afford. Now, really quickly want to say this before we dive into all this, these numbers here, um, should be like what you should afford and what you could afford are going to be two different things. Um, a lender is going to tell you the maximum of the loan that you could get. And that's what we would call what you could afford. Um, what you should afford is based on what's comfortable for you in your monthly payment. Just because a lender tells you you can qualify for a $700,000 home doesn't mean it's smart for you to go buy a $700,000 home. No lender is a financial advisor, um, and their job is to help you understand qualifying for a mortgage, not does buying a house meet your long-term financial goals. Only you know that. Only you know if you want to have a nice house and you're comfortable uh, reducing how much you eat out. Um, only you know if you have vacations you're trying to save up for or retirement or if buying a home is going to get in the way of paying for your kid's college. Um, all of those decisions are budget decisions that you need to make only based on your budget, not what a lender tells you. So uh, for $10,000 a month for Kenya, we're going to do $120,000 per year. That is 12. Oops. Okay, $120,000 per year. And then Kenya also said uh, $1,800 per month in debt. So a student loan and a car note. So um, what we'll look at when you're uh, determining how much mortgage you could get, it's based on your minimum monthly debt payments. Okay, so here's what is and isn't a debt. What is a debt is car loans, student loans, credit cards, personal loans, rental, property, mortgages, alimony, and child support. What is not a debt is rent, groceries, utilities, your phone bill, insurance, um, and other expenses like gas and food. Those don't have balances to them like a debt does. So um, we don't have these separated out here, but I'm just going to put student loan plus uh, car. And again, this is not what you pay. Um, maybe you pay extra on your car, and that's perfectly fine. But in your debt to income ratio, we're going to use your minimum monthly uh, debt payment. So I'll put 1800 here. And then we don't have a co-borrower, so I'm just going to zero these out. Okay, so we entered our information. Then we go over to the affordability dashboard. Okay, and I did something wrong here. What did I do wrong, Dan? <laughs> You'll I figure clicked, it out. You're a genius when it comes to this I stuff. I click the wrong, th uh, maybe it's because I made a <clears throat> copy of this. What a bad demo to uh, to just come in here and... It doesn't work. Hold on. You might have. I, I when I did it one time, the um, I overwrote a cell in Excel. That's like when you overwrote the income or the the co borrower's debt. I bet you you deleted a, a a function. That is probably what I did. Um, the uh, oh, I'm working on a version of that that won't do that won't do that anymore, but, um, I don't have it yet. All right. Well, let's pause on that until I figure out the solution and then we're going to come back. You want to just open questions. up a new one? Uh, I'm, I'm running into an issue over here with, with all this. So, okay. um, let me jump back to <clears throat> questions and then maybe we'll circle back into it. If I can figure out what I did wrong, <laughs> not a great demo. Um, let's see here. Uh, when looking to refinance, I see my credit union's website, um, and the rate says 6.49%, and then parentheses it says 6.46 APR. Uh, what's the difference? Um, do you want to take that? I don't know what the APR is. Yeah, I'll take it. Like. It's, what you really want to be concerned with, I'll, I'll tell you just the basics behind it. Okay, the, the interest rate is basically how that payment is calculated, okay? The APR... It takes into effect the costs. So basically, the bigger the variance between your rate and your APR means you're going to pay a ton of fees. Okay, so here's how it works. Let's say you're getting a $100,000 uh, loan, okay, and the rate's 
6.49%. It's a 30 year rate. So that means your payment is X. Okay. Let's say it's 500 bucks. I'm just making that up, but you're going to have, let's say $3,000 in fees. So your APR is, is calculated this way. They say, well, you have $3,000 in fees. So your true loan is 97,000. So if we do 97,000 with a $500 payment on a 30 year uh, loan term, what would be the effect? What would be the effective rate on that? Because you had fees, and that's the APR. So really, all you need to do is pay attention to the bigger the difference, the more the fees you're paying. So a lot of times people say, "Oh, I'm getting a six percent rate," and then I look at it, and the APR is seven point two five, and I'm like, "How much are you paying in fees?" They're like, "Nothing." I'm like, "You are paying a lot in fees," because I can mm -hmm. tell by the APR. Then they'll send it to me and say, "I didn't realize I was paying, you know, ten thousand dollars in costs." I'm like, "Well, that's why we're here." I'm curious why the APR is lower. It shouldn't be lower. Um, and that, and that one, it's, yeah. That is just something unless on the website didn't update correctly um, because it yeah. just wouldn't make sense. Um, You're one 100th difference. So I would say basically they're not charging you anything, you know, based on the rate in the APR, which is odd because they're most likely going to have like title fees, maybe an appraisal, maybe something there. If they charge you a fee at all, it would be kind of distributed in there. So maybe their, their billboard it's, just didn't, I don't know. Yeah. It's more of their website know. probably just didn't update correctly. Um, so they should probably do that. Uh, Pete, you said in the current market, are you guys seeing FHA two, three K, uh, rehab loans being accepted? Wait, didn't we answer this already? Uh, wondering if yeah, that would be less competitive because of time to close versus, uh, FHA or conventional loan. Yeah. I'll answer that part of it. Yeah, there was the two, the the question of the 203k. We're not getting a lot of them. Now, I've done a lot in the past, you know, back four, five, seven years ago. I mean, a lot of loans were 203k loans. Recently, you don't see a lot of it because, again, those fix and flippers are out there. You got people buying up that market before it actually hits the public. So by the time it gets the houses get to the public where you and I can buy them, they're fixer uppers. They've already been scavengered by all the investors. Um, it shouldn't really be... Uh, a, an issue for the seller in that situation because they know that the house needs repairs. Uh, so if you're, you can't even get an FHA loan if the house needs repaired, you can in some cases get a conventional loan. But I think uh, the sellers, if they're being realistic and they're working with a good realtor, they understand that uh, the house is only going to sell via 203k loan. And yes, it is going to take a little bit longer than a standard loan, but not that much. The, the biggest issue there is you're going to need as the buyer, you're going to need to get quotes and things like that on, on you know, on what you're looking to do to the property. Uh, and then we have to validate those quotes and do some things. So the initial paperwork's a little bit more. Um, and then there will be stages. It depends on how much you're doing to the property of payouts to the, 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 um, the contractors. But yeah, it will extend your closing time a little bit. But again, if, you're, if you have a realistic seller and, and, and realtor, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, Jeremiah, you asked, does USDA have more fees stacked on a mortgage than an FHA loan that would make USDA cost more monthly? Um, no, USDA is cheaper both in its upfront mortgage insurance, although USDA calls it a guarantee fee instead of upfront mortgage insurance. And then the monthly mortgage insurance is lower on USDA than FHA. Um, so USDA is a, a cheaper option than, uh, than FHA. Triple J Zoo, um, I'm currently engaged in looking at buying a house with my future wife. Um, is there a way to show lenders that will have dual income in the future or can I only use uh, my income? No, you can use both of you. It doesn't even matter, you know, at this time, if you guys are living separately, you have different last names, anything, you can have a co-borrower. You can even have a non-occupying co-borrower, meaning the person isn't even going to be living with you. We have that a lot where, you know, mom and dad might co-sign for one of their children because they just have a lot of student loan debt, maybe. So they can't qualify on their own. So mom and dad co-sign, they have no intentions of living there. Um, or they might be living there. It doesn't matter. You can have non-occupant co-borrowers in a lot of the programs out there. And, uh, but you don't need to wait until you have the same last name or married or anything like that. You can apply now and you can use both of your incomes. Uh, Tony Liu, uh, I think, uh, which down payment percentage gets you the best interest rate? Um, hundred on... <laughs> percent. Right. Um, if you go to win the house, you love.com slash rate hack, uh, I have this chart here. 
that shows you an estimated change in rate based on down payment and credit score. So it is going to change based on your credit score, but with the highest credit score, um, putting 25% down uh, isn't going to be, or yeah, putting Anywhere after 25% down uh, is going to give you the best rate possible compared to a higher down payment percentage. And then that is going to change depending on uh, what your credit score is. So that might be a good chart to take a look at. Uh, and what you guys need to understand too is the chart that Kyle just showed you. That's not like points. It, it's basically like, like fees. So that might equate out to a difference in your rate of like 0.05. Five maybe. So this you know, is actually some of those converted areas. into rate uh, change. Oh, you did do that. Okay, yep. my bad. I did because some of them are based on um, other charts. So yeah, okay. Yep. So I had a gentleman that today. He's like, well, I only have a seven sixty. I plan on putting down, you know, five or ten percent, and it's really driving me nuts. Well, if you look over there, the difference in your rate would be basically, you know, point. 25 instead of 0.125. So an eighth of a difference in fees. I mean, you're talking a $500,000 loan, you're talking 500 bucks, I think. So it's not that detrimental. And you can see where it really gets, you really get pounded when your scores are way down there and you're not putting much down. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerome also has to have red eyes and a thumbnail. Yeah. Uh, that also is, he's usually got like red lasers coming out of his eyes. Um, triple Trust me, I've gotten in a lot of heated debates with a lot of those YouTubers. And the funny thing is I go on some of their websites when they're having live events and they ban me immediately. And I, when I ask them why they're like, because we watch your videos and all you do is tell everybody they have to buy a home. And I'm like, I never told anybody they have to buy a home. We're just here to you know help educate you and do this. Um, Triple J Zoo, I asked because I prefer to wait until we're married, until both of our names are on the loan, um, but that could significantly affect what I qualify for. You do not have to do that. Uh, after you get married, you can just submit, um, and like tell your lender, uh, hey, my name changed or my spouse's name changed. Um, just give them the documentation they need and they'll update it for you. So no problem at all. It's not uh, set in stone. Just like with every other thing, um, people change with uh, name ch changes from marriage. Uh, houses work exactly the same. Um, Tridzo, uh, hello, just wondering for self-employment. Lenders use the net, correct? Uh, correct, debating if I should um, calm down on, oh, calm down on my write-offs. Yeah. Here, I'll give you a little bit of a tidbit. If you if you can do this, um, self-employed people, you can add back depreciation and depletion. So if you have anything possible that you can depreciate, please do so. And that's where you can kind of you know, get the biggest bang for your buck because that those numbers come back in to your net income. But you are correct um, with that. A lot of people don't realize that. They're, you know, when I, we talk to them, they're like, I make 300000 a year. Do I qualify for this and that and this and that? It's like, yeah. But then when we get the tax returns in, their net income is like forty grand, and it's like, well, you don't qualify. And then a lot of people get upset with us and they just don't understand this, this part of it. So thank you so much for that question. Um, okay, James, um, how would you recommend factoring in RSUs into budgeting for a house? So restricted stock units. Um, really, I would only factor in income that you actually have. So with RSUs, for instance, if they're not vested, um, then I wouldn't factor them into my budget because it's not actually money you can touch yet. And I don't think it'd be good to, to base a budget on um, future income basically is what a non-vested RSU would, would effectively be like in your budget. So if they're fully vested and you have access to them, um, then I think that could be a smart move as long as um, you feel like the value isn't going to be so all over the place that it may mess up your budget. Um, and if you are going to use that in your budgeting, uh, then I would really make sure that you have at least six months of an emergency fund um, to make sure that let's say the value um, of those go down, then you have a little bit more of a cushion um, than just three months. Uh, so I'd bump your emergency fund up to about six months for that. Uh, Dan gave us a prequal, then both of us got raises, uptick in credit scores and additional savings from bonus tax. Um, sweet. Uh, do we update the prequal letter now or wait till we found find a house we like? 
you can actually just email me um, your new income. Um, if you're, well, if you're looking to increase your purchase price, yeah, go ahead and update everything now. Uh, just email it to me and then let me know what, you know, if you want your, your purchase price or your pre-qualification amount upped or increased. Um, I wouldn't wait till the last minute. So send me all that stuff now. I'll update it and see. I want to make sure you still, we can still get you pre-qualified with, I don't know if you got like a grant program or something like that. So we have to update things. So please email that to me and then I'll be in touch with you. If I don't get in touch with you today, I'll be in touch with you for sure tomorrow to go over any changes that, that might have made. Uh, so thanks so much for you know, providing us that. And thanks for being here. Um, Sheila, you said I uh, clicked on the rate or the link in the description for today's rates and nothing comes up. I just checked on two different web browsers and it's working for me. Um, so I'm not sure why that link wouldn't work, but, um, the, if you go to win the house, slash rates, uh, it pulls up the national average interest rates. Um, Jalen, any thoughts on buying half a duplex as opposed to a townhouse, um, buying half a duplex. Uh, do you mean like as a condo? Cause you can't just purchase like half of a duplex. Um, unless I'm thinking about this thing wrong. I think I mean, it's, it's like, here's the duplex. They just want to buy one side. You know what I mean? So uh, they're buying their okay. whole unit. It's a two unit building that they're buying one, one of the units. It's kind of the same, you know, that's uh, how I okay. would look at it. It's kind of like a townhouse or a condo or anything else. So I wouldn't even think twice about it. If you like it, go with it. Uh, Trevor said, Hey Kyle, I'm meeting with a realtor for the first time. I have all my wants and needs, but I'm curious if you have anything I should inquire about. Um, I'm looking around 400,000, uh, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Uh, thanks in advance. Um, sweet. Um, if you already have your wants and needs, I think that's fantastic. What I would then do, and I, I'm hoping you're already pre-qualified. If not, you can go right up here, uh, with house and schedule a call with a member of our team. Um, what I would do is have them or ask them about your uh, price range and see like where they think that's most realistic and what different areas. Um, because I would start looking at all the different pockets and where you're looking at and starting to see what's happening in all those different neighborhoods with prices, with competition. Um, again, we like to use the, the Altos reports to start to see um, what's going on in those markets in terms of like, is that market starting to have a decline in action? So maybe I can, um, potentially put in a better offer or more, uh, a lower offer, um, in those markets. Um, I start taking a look at that and then also how feasible is your budget in some of these markets as well. Um, often what happens for a lot of people is they go in saying, I'm looking at 400,000. Um, but the market that they're looking in really only starts to get interesting or have, um, nice inventory around maybe 500,000 and they keep running into roadblocks there because their budget isn't realistic for the neighborhood that they're looking in. So I would have a more honest conversation with them about that uh, because I know realtors run into that issue a lot too, where it's, they're trying to get you what you want, but it may not be realistic in one specific neighborhood versus a few others that may be on your list. Um, do, 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 do the Ammon Nelson, um, down payment assistance programs, what are pros cons to these type of programs and are they hard to qualify for? You want to go for it? Um, yeah, there's honestly, there's tons of down payment assistance programs. There's probably thousands of them. Um, most of them come with a catch there. They might be like city, state, county grants out there and so forth. Um, the, the, the pros, let's go with the cons first. We have, you know, we have access to all these. We basically promote like three or four of them. And those are what Kyle and I do videos on. The reason being is, the other ones are usually, they're not great financial advice loans, I guess is the best way to put it, because they'll come with higher interest rates, higher fees, higher points, higher this. So you might get $7,500 in a grant per se, but by the time it nets out, you might actually get 2000 bucks. But to get that $2,000, you're paying a higher rate on the first mortgage. You might have a second mortgage that actually is providing you with the down payment assistance. So those are the cons. You have to really be careful on which ones you get into. The pros, um, some of them, like we have a, we have three programs going on right now. One is the one plus, and you saw that a couple of people on the screen popped up and said they got pre-approved with that. Mm -hmm. What that is, is uh, Fannie Mae offers and Freddie Mac offers a first time home buyer program with only 3% down. What that program does, it'll give you two of the 
for basically nothing. It, there's no cost to you. There's no, the, the interest rate is a little bit higher. Um, I think it's a quarter, I think they were telling us. And, but there's not a lot of fees and things like that associated with it. There's no paybacks. There's no liens. There's no nothing. Uh, another one is $10,000. $10,000. It's the same rate, same everything, same fee structure and everything. So you truly get 10000 bucks. Um, so there's, there are some really good ones out there, but you really have to be careful. I had a young man book me this morning saying, Hey, I got a, an FHA loan. They're giving me free, you know, no money down, free this, free that. And I said, please do me a favor, ask for a loan estimate, send that to me. Once you get it, let's analyze it because I almost can assure you, you're not getting what you think you're getting. So, and are they hard to qualify? Basically you need to be a first time home buyer in many of those situations and you can't exceed a certain income level. So those are the two big things. And uh, Kyle is working on actually uh, another program or another website for us that you can actually go in there, fill in all your information. It'll tell you exactly which one of these programs is best for you. Uh, let's see what percentage of people do you see closing on a house? Um, actually have the seller, or another party cover the closing cost here recently. Um, I don't know if I can give a percentage on the people closing on a house. I can tell you what I see internally, and it's probably 75% of people right now on the offers are getting some incentives from the seller. Mm -hmm. It might be two grand, might be three grand, might be you know free home warranties and all this other stuff. But uh, there are, you know, in most cases, it's probably between three and five thousand uh, dollars seller concessions. Probably, like I said, on at least seventy percent of the loans coming in. Uh, do, 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 do. Penny, uh, just got pre-approved with your team for one plus. Um, what would be the estimated closing costs, or what would the estimate? Yeah, what would the estimated closing costs be? Two hundred thirty thousand dollar purchase price. You want to take that? Yeah. So Penny, it's, <clears throat> I'll, I'll answer it specifically and with an answer you're not going to like, but then I'll conclude with something. So here's what happens is we, in this case, we probably have no points, no fees, no nothing on your loan. Okay. So the lender fee is going to be zero. When you're buying a house, 90% of the other costs involved are title or legal fees. Okay. We don't know what they are. Okay. What happens is the seller and the seller's representation, they're going to choose a title or an escrow company, and they're going to they're going to do all the title work, the legal work, and then they're going to send us an invoice. That invoice, I can guarantee you, is going to match to the T that we're going to charge you, but we don't know what those fees are because we can give you a good idea, but we don't know what it is because every title company out there, and there's thousands of them, they have different fees. So what I could assure you though is whatever you know those fees would be on our loan at the end of the, the end result is whatever those fees are, are exactly what you're going to pay. Now, here's where a lot of people get duped. We are, we're going to try our darndest to give you the most accurate quotes at the time that we send you out a fee sheet. Okay. We don't, we're not going to issue a loan estimate in most cases because we're not the lender in most of these cases, especially when you're getting a down payment assistance program. So we can't issue you what's called a loan estimate. We can issue you what's called a fee worksheet. It's going to match our loan estimate to the T. Okay. So that's that. But where a lot of people get duped is they're going to, they're, I'm going to give you the most accurate numbers that we possibly can. Okay. And, but again, there it's, it's a loan estimate. So we don't truly know the numbers where you got to watch for is another lender coming in and saying, well, you know, Dan gave you that pre-approval and the loan estimate. He's saying your title fees are going to be $4,000. Look at our loan estimate. It's only showing $2,000. Well, they don't even know yet. So that's, please be careful when it comes to that, because again, it doesn't matter any lender you choose, whoever that might be, when the seller's representation sends our, us that, that those fee sheets, they're going to send it to every lender. It doesn't matter what lender you're going to use. So your legal fees are going to be to the penny the same, no matter what lender you choose. Okay. Aretha Johnson, uh, please help. We're going to build a home and they're asking 6% down. Um, we're going FHA. Please explain if you can. Uh, FHA's minimum requirement for down payment is 3.5%. Um, if they're asking for six, there's only a couple things I can think of. Um, one, I would actually double check. Are they actually asking for 6% down? It's very possible that what you're looking at is the estimated cash to close and that's the down payment plus closing costs. And maybe that's adding up to 6%. I'm not entirely certain. So I first look at, is the down payment actually 3.5%? Um, the only other thing is 
In some cases, maybe increasing the down payment helped you qualify because it got your debt to income ratio slightly lower. Um, those would really be the only things I'm thinking of for the, yeah. This this is weird. I just helped somebody get pre-qualified to buy a house in the villages in Florida. They're going FHA, but they're required, I think to put five or 10% down. And that was a requirement. Oh, the HOA requires by, that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's the first time I've ever seen that ever. So that might be where the builders coming in saying, we have so many people buying right now and falling out and everything. We're requiring you, whatever you show us on your pre-approval, you have at least, you know, 6% hmm. or more down or something. I, that's the only thing I can think of, but I did run into yeah. that recently. Yeah. That'd be strange. I'd be interested to see what's uh, what is, uh, there's no FHA requirement that 6%. So there's no, something not. else going on. There's something else there. Um, JC Franco, how valuable are loans that have already gone through the underwriting process? Um, valuable to who, I guess. <laughs> uh, if I then switch to another lender, do I have to go through the underwriting process again? Um, yes. So if you switch to another lender, the other lender is going to have to underwrite you. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a good like comparison situation. Basically, no, like no one's going to no lender is going to trust that another lender did their job correctly because they're not the one having to lend the money out. Um, if they're whoever's lending the money is the one who's going to want to underwrite that. Um, but as far as if you mean like how valuable is it? Like is it difficult to go through again? Uh, no, you already had your documents collected. You can just resubmit them. Um, the initial underwriting process normally takes two days, like forty eight hours. So it really shouldn't be that difficult to uh, to switch over. Um, can I add to that? Sorry, I keep adding sure. today. Just so you know, um, JC, here's here's what happens behind the scenes. So just so you guys get it, when you put in your application, like if you go to Win the House You Love or whatever sites we have for our online applications, what we're going to do is you're going to put in your application. We're then going to do a hard credit pool. Yes, it will be a hard credit pool and it will affect your credit score maybe like two points. So then what happens is all of us, I don't care where you got pre, that you already got the pre-qualification from or whatever, we all do the same thing at this point. We upload your information into Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, both at the same time. Okay. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's going to do a, a quick auto, you know, auto valuation of your credit scenario. And then it's going to kick back saying the loan's approved or it's not approved. Okay. So then at that point, the underwriter's job is to validate all the data. Okay. So why I'm saying this is if one lender got you approved, basically everybody should be able to get you approved unless the, the other person was doing fraud. All right. So if you've already been pre-approved, you're good. This is where I, I tell a lot of people or say to a lot of people, why do you keep calling and getting pre-approved with multiple lenders? And the, the, the main reason is you're trying to figure out who's got the best rate and the lowest fees. That's what you're looking for. Because again, if one person can get you approved, basically, technically everybody should. That's why where we come into play. So you don't, you can do a one application, a one, one credit pool, and we're going to sc uh, scan your loan with over 73 different lenders all over the country. So that was a perfect dude. You prompted that up. I give it, give Kyle a guac. Come on, thank you, folks. Thank you, thank you. We actually clicked that right. Perfect time and guac, everybody. Guac. It's like, so that's inside basically your what head. happens behind the scenes. So that's why we plead, you know, reach out to us. It's going to be one credit pool, one application, and we're going to shop your loan all over the place. Are we guaranteeing you the best rate in the whole country? No because we're not set up with every bank in the whole country. But are we going to do a pretty good job, probably a much better job than you would by just calling, 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 calling? Absolutely, we will. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Sorry, I didn't have another question. Cute up. Uh, Look at Trevor, he's there. Deborah, Guac. Uh, C. Nigel, um, talk to Alan. Alan's on our team. Uh, Pre-qualified for $500,000 um, and now shopping, but pickings are slim. What kind of loans do you have for new construction? Caveat, we have... Uh, we currently, uh, our home has about $200,000 equity. Um, so new construction is not different than existing homes. Um, there really isn't anything, uh, special or different for new construction, um, on the lending side. Hey, did you get your calculator fixed yet? Uh, no, I'm gonna have to look at it later. We'll, we'll, we can, can you just open screen. up a new one or no? Uh, I, theoretically, but I'm, it's a different issue that I'm running into. Um, okay. No worries. Hello from Tampa. Are there any loopholes to the two year for self-employed people? Um, I started self-employment in October of 2022, graduated from college in 2022. Um, 
I'm just trying to get that timeline. Is there an exception for college? No, the only real exception for shorter than two years self-employed is let's say you were, uh, let's say you're a graphic designer uh, on a W-2 income for a couple of years, and then you switch to doing freelance graphic design and you've done that for at least one year, then that's pretty much the only way to get around that self-employment two-year mark is to have one year of self-employment, but you pretty much did exactly what you did before just in a W-2 capacity. Um, college, unfortunately, does not count as self-employment. It does count for standard employment, but not for self-employment um, because a lender wants to see consistency of your income and they need to see two years of that. Um, I, I get it. It's frustrating because, you know, in the lending world, W-2 income is seems so stable, um, even though you can still be let go at any time. So it's annoying, but uh, unfortunately, there's no good way around that. Uh, okay, Trevor, um, as a first time buyer, do I get a newly do I get a newly renovated condo with high HOA? or a much larger square foot fixer upper for weight under budget where I invest the remaining budget to the renovation. Sorry for being vague. Um, you know, those are hard. The person in the video big. with you, what does she want? <laughs> <laughs> or the, the person in the picture down there, because I don't know if that's your, and I apologize, I don't know if it's your wife, spouse, significant other or whatever, but, you know, make her happy and you'll be happy. So, and I'm sorry yeah. if that's like your sister or relative, so I think wasn't trying to be creepy. There's no, sorry. G- there's no good answer to this. Um, and, and don't, there's no right answer. There's not like some magical choice that all of a sudden everything works out and it wouldn't have worked out. Oh, it, Trevor said it's uh, their partner, so you're good. Um, the it really just comes down to not only the the cost difference, but it also is a lifestyle difference too. Most people don't want to buy a fixer upper and manage all the issues that come with it. And I'd really only look at that if you have either a good amount of cash to be able to put into the fix, um, and you're pretty comfortable with understanding how big the scope of the project is going to be. A lot of people kind of feel like, uh, or not. Maybe that's not fair. I I think a lot of people can see things like HGTV and then, you know, magic of editing and everything looked really easy and cheap and simple. In reality, it was a nightmare and it cost tons of money um, and wouldn't have worked unless they had super skilled or experienced contractors. So I'd make sure if you are buying a fixer upper, you're really confident in the amount of money it's going to cost. You have extra cash to play around with um, and your timeline works well. Also, where are you going to live uh, in the meantime while this is being fixed up? Uh, that's a consideration I'd have in there as well. Um, versus some people are really comfortable with just buying, you know, they're willing to pay money for something that's move-in ready. Um, so when it comes down to the numbers, I can't answer from just a question like this um, without more detail. But I would consider like the lifestyle impact of it first and then take a look at the numbers. But either way, um, there isn't like a wrong there's not a wrong or right choice um, in there. Um, sweet. So we, <laughs> okay. You want to clear up a debate between Aretha? Please clear up the debate with the husband. High credit score and low debt to income ratio helps with a lower rate. The debt ratio really doesn't come in to play truly. It might be a determinant if you can go with a conventional loan or an FHA, but the credit score, it, it basically the biggest components of your mortgage rate or the factors behind that is your loan to value. So how much money you're going to put down and then what your credit score is. So you were both half right, I guess. The debt rates, the debt to income usually doesn't really even play a role um, mm. in that. So, yeah. So hopefully yeah. at least one of you won. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where like changing five points in your credit score could get you a lower rate. Changing five percentage points in your debt to income ratio isn't going to change your rate. Um, so, uh, awesome. Well, Oh, how did, why is that still up there? Um, there we go. So next step, uh, if you're ready to take a look at what you can get pre-qualified for, we work in all 50 States. You can go to win the house you love.com. Um, and what we do is we have you schedule a call, uh, and then fill out an application. So we're not going to chase you down. We're not going to barrage you with texts and calls um, because nobody enjoys doing that. We don't enjoy doing that. I'm sure you don't like it either. Um, And so what we do is you can ask us questions on the call just like you would here. So um, you'll have a scheduled call either with Dan uh, here below, um, David Pies on our team, or Alan Platt, um, who all have 
so over 20 years of experience um i don't i need to really up my game here <laughs> um, you're the so, young whippersnapper on the team yeah so you schedule a call you'll have an application we'll show you your quotes and then you can shop for a home so we'll be doing this live stream again next week same time same place uh 3 30 eastern um on wednesday um and then uh I just see someone, well, just someone said super chat. Um, go ahead and email me, uh, buck buck, and I will, I can do that for you um, over email um, since we're about to head off here. So thank you all for being here. If you have any questions, again, just go to winhouseyoulove.com. You can click ask a question. You can schedule a call with us um, and we would be happy to help. We will see you all next week.